Have you ever headed out fly fishing, all excited to get out there on the water? Maybe it's like your only day off, or you just managed to squeeze in a few hours in that really hectic schedule, and you park, you open your car door, and you're almost blown to friggin' Kansas because the wind is just howling. Well, that can be pretty depressing, especially in the spring when A, it's windy, and B, we've all got cabin fever and want to get out on the water. And back when I started fly fishing, I would even let the wind dictate when I would fish. I've actually, and I'm not proud to say this, I left trips before because it was too windy to fish. After listening to today's show, however, you won't feel like leaving's even an option because you will be armed with five tips to help you effectively fly fish in the wind. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. Excited and happy to be behind the microphone instead of outside where I got to hold on to my hat because it's spring in Wyoming and that means it's windy. Granted, it's windy all the time in Wyoming, but it's especially windy in the spring and that's very apropos because the topic of this week's show is how to fly fish in the wind. We've actually had quite a few questions lately come in from listeners about fly casting and fly fishing when it gets really windy outside. And again, given that it's spring, which does tend to be the windiest time of year, not just here in Wyoming, but I think, I think everywhere, at least where I've lived. uh, I reckon this is a really good time to talk about the subject. Now I do have five tips that are going to help you become much more adept at fly casting in the wind. I'm going to go really in depth on the first of these five tips uh, quite a bit because it's key to understanding everything else. You got to know this first thing. You have to really understand the why behind it, which is a big thing that we're all about here at Untangled anyways, is understanding the why. And once you understand the why behind this one, the rest of the tips will make quite a bit of sense. But this first tip is all about creating higher line speed in tighter loops. Now, I'll explain what those things mean in a minute, but I just want you to remember this thing right off the get-go. Line speed is your best friend when there's wind. This is something that Tim Rajev talks about a lot. And Tim, for those of you who don't know, he is one of the world's best fly casters. He's won fly casting world championships, and he's the head rod designer for Echo Fly Rods. So he knows a thing or two about casting. Rajev, excuse me, Ray Jeff actually did a video on casting into strong winds. Now, in this video, he's out in, I I believe he was in the Bahamas. And, oh, excuse me again, I apologize. He he was out in the Bahamas uh, fishing in saltwater. But those same principles apply to freshwater. I mean, wind is wind. So you've got to deal with it regardless. I'm going to link that video in the show notes for y'all so you can go take a look at it because Tim does an excellent job of explaining these concepts. but. Uh, I, I do want to give him his credit there, but Tim talks about this a lot. He's one of the authorities and just about every other person who knows fly casting is going to talk about this as well. Now, the reason that you want higher line speed when you're dealing with wind is that higher line speed is going to inherently generate narrow tight loops of fly line. And those loops, when they're nice and narrow, they're actually going to cut through the wind much more effectively than big wide loops do. Think of it almost like skipping stones, right? A flat, smooth stone. When you fling it out there, it cuts through the air and then it bounces on the water perfectly. It's got the right profile to slice through the air and keep some of that energy and bounce and skip along the water. A big boulder, you throw it out there, it just makes a splash. So, and that's what we're not aiming for with our fly cast. Uh, Another way to think of it, Alex actually shared this with me, is... It's a nice summer day. You're cruising in the truck. You got the tunes up. You're headed to go fishing. And you stick your arm out the window. And when you stick your hand straight up, and if you're watching the podcast, you'll see, like, if you're going to go to high five somebody, you stick your, your hand straight up. The wind's, like, really pushing against it, and your hand doesn't cut through the wind as much. But if you just lay your hand to the side like this or just point it straight, and again, if you're watching the video podcast, you'll get the visual here then all of a sudden your hand cuts through the wind a lot 
better, a lot more effectively. So that's the same concept that you want to hang on to when you're thinking about fly casting into the wind. Narrow, tight loops of line are going to cut through the wind much more effectively than big, wide ones. Now, the best way to get those tight loops is to generate higher line speed. And the best way to generate higher line speed on any rod is to use a casting technique called a double haul. The double haul is, it, it, it is pretty simple at the end of the day. It takes some practice to get the hang of the timing, but it's not like I'm asking you to like make a pretzel with your hands and like face east when you do it or anything crazy like that. It, it, it's not even a Ricky Bobby moment. You know, for those of you who've seen the movie about the philosopher Ricky Bobby when he's got his first interview and he's sitting there, he's, well, I don't, I don't know what to do with my hands, right? It, it, it's not, not even that hard to figure out. Uh, it, it's just a timing thing, and it just takes a little bit of practice. Uh, but what this double haul does is it helps your fly line move faster, and it creates those tight loops that we just talked about. Tim Ray Jeff, he demonstrates an excellent double haul in that video I mentioned, uh, and it is linked, but I'm going to explain it here for those of you who are listening. And I'm going to make my explanation as if you are a right-handed caster. So if you're a lefty, then just reverse everything I'm saying. But I cast right-handed, and I believe the majority of folks cast right-handed as well. So I'm going to explain it that way. Again, I'm going to explain this as if uh, you're a right-handed caster. So I've actually got the butt section of the fly flinger here with me. This is our new and improved one. It's real fancy. It's the same rod, we just dressed it up a little bit. It looks, it looks really pretty now. But I'm going to use this as a visual aid for those who are watching the podcast, so hopefully it'll make a little bit of sense. All right, so you've got your rod and your casting hand, and your right hand, and as you move the rod back during the casting strokes, so I've got the rod coming back here, you're going to pull down on the fly line that's in your left hand. So the rod goes back, and you pull down just like that. Then you let your left hand bounce back up. Then when you move the rod forward during your casting stroke, you pull down on the fly line again. So it's a back, you pull down, and pull down on the forward cast. So you go back, back, or back, forward, back, forward, and you're making that haul motion with your hands each time. Now, the length of your haul, and I, I hope that visual aid was helpful for those who are watching the show, Oh, but the, the length of your haul, which is the motion of pulling line during the cast, should be equal to your casting stroke. For example, if you're making a normal cast at like 40 feet, your left hand should move maybe 8 to 10 inches during the haul. You're not going to move a ton during that haul. Now, if you're really going for distance or you have a heavy fly on, you'll want to increase the length of that haul to match your casting stroke. The double haul, like I said, it can take some time to master, and it's often used in conjunction with other methods to fight the wind as well. But the double haul is something every angler needs to learn to do because it is another tool in your toolbox to cast effectively, not just when there's wind, uh, but in any situation we need to generate higher line speed, to maybe turn over heavier rigs or even really long leaders. You, you can get a little bit extra line speed and turn over longer leaders more effectively that way. So that is your number one thing. Generate high line speed, create tight loops. You're going to cut through the wind more effectively. You do that with a double haul. But the double haul is not the only way to fight the wind. For instance, you can use a sidearm cast. So instead of casting directly overhead, you can cast with the rod mostly parallel to the ground. This still allows the tip to move in a straight line, but it importantly puts the fly line away from your head and reduces the risk of hooking yourself during a bad wind gust. And on top of all that, it keeps your flies lower to the ground where the wind can be moving slower than a few feet above your head in the air. It may not be a huge difference, but it might be enough to help you get that extra foot or so on the cast that you're, you're looking for. Uh, another tip to help you fight the wind is make sure that you compensate for the wind if it's blowing your flies to the left or to the right. If the wind is blowing to your right, you've got to aim a bit more to your left to get your flies to land where you want them. So just make sure you're compensating for that. And there's no like hard and fast way to do that. It's just something that you, you have to experiment with while you're on the water, depending on how bad the wind is. 
another tip for you as well. I believe this is tip number three, four. I'm losing count. Uh, we'll call it number three. Make sure you reduce your false casting. The more false casts you make, the greater chance you have of getting your line tangled in the wind and getting your flies tangled up in themselves. So you're, you should make as few false casts as you need. Try to pick up a lot of line. And with that double haul, it's really nice because you can pick up a lot of line. If you haul, when you pick the line up off the water, you can generally pick up more line than if you just lift and go right into your back cast without a haul. So it's nice to be able to use that haul to pick the line up, haul again to push that line out there. And within two casts, maybe you can recast easy just so you don't have very many false casts. Just reduces the chance of getting tangled. Uh, one more option is you can consider the Belgian cast. I believe this is tip number five. Uh, the Belgian cast, there's a lot of different names for this. Uh, I've heard it called the oval cast as well. But really what it entails is that you are going to move your fly rod in a bit of a loop off to your side. You don't want to do this above your head, but it goes off to your side. And you want this loop to be made so that your fly rod is constantly moving during the cast. Because in a regular overhead cast, your fly rod stops at least twice, right? Once on the back cast, once on the forward cast. You're waiting for the line to unfurl behind you and the line to unfurl in front of you. You're waiting for that to happen, so your rod is stopping. And when that rod stops, it can actually uh, rob you of some power on your cast, especially if you're dealing with wind. With a Belgian cast, your rod never stops, so there's always tension pushing and pulling on your fly line which can help it turn over better in the heavy wind. And one last bonus tip here for you as well. If it is really windy, then consider just moving to streamers or nymphs. Those heavier rigs turn over easier in the wind, and a lot of wind will end up blowing bugs off the water anyways, and fish can tend to focus on eating nymphs at that point. And even if it doesn't blow them off the water, like I, I was on the water yesterday, there was a beautiful hatch, and the wind was just gusty enough that I could not get my flies to land anywhere that I wanted them to. And the fish were still rising. They were taking a merger. So they weren't even eating duns. They were taking stuff right below the surface. So I very easily could have tied on like a, a really big dry fly and then either a little emerger behind it or even like an unweighted midge pattern and just thrown that out there. And even though that's not a nymph or a streamer, that's a bigger, heavier rig that's going to turn my leader over better. And that might have been the way to go yesterday, to be honest, because I got my butt kicked during that hatch because I refused to go to the flies that I probably needed to in order to beat the wind. I was like, oh, I can cast through the wind just fine. And I just, the wind was so gusty, I just couldn't get the flies to land where I wanted them to. So hopefully those tips help you out with your fly fishing in the wind endeavors. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to take in. But if you have any more questions about fly casting and fly fishing in the wind, please do not hesitate to send those on in. And now, folks, it is time to get comfortable and get ready for the Q&A portion of this week's show. We are going to be talking all about some tips for fishing with dry flies, uh, how to set up good nymphing rigs, advice on what leaders you actually need, fly fishing road trips, and working in the fly fishing and outdoors community. So stay tuned for the rest of this show. All right, folks, before we get into the Q&A section of the show this week, I do just want to address one thing with everyone. Uh, we've had a ton of questions come in recently, and I'm absolutely stoked about that. I, <laughs> When we started Untangled, I never thought, A, it would be this, uh, this successful, and B, that this many people would actually write questions in. I was worried that we would never have enough. And now we're at the point where it feels like I need to do two episodes a week just to keep up with all the questions that we're getting. And I don't want anybody to feel like I'm ignoring you or that your question wasn't good or anything like that. Uh, I, I promise I will do my best to get your questions answered. I might not get to every single one of them. It just might not be feasible, but I will do my best. I will try my absolute best to get to them. I do try to answer questions in the order that they get submitted, but I do have to mix questions up a little bit to create an engaging show each week because sometimes like the four or five questions that I get 
right in a row. They don't really flow together. They don't make for a great engaging show. So I do jump around a bit. So anyways, long story short, I'm answering questions. I really appreciate y'all sending them in. And if you have any more, please send them in. There's always a link in the podcast description. I'm going to do my best to answer them. And speaking of answering a question, Jordan from Wales writes in, and he's got a wonderful question to start us off this week. He says, I've fished most of my life, but only recently got into fly fishing. So I wanted to start off by saying a huge thank you to yourself, Spencer, and VFC for publishing such educating content in an entertaining way, both on the podcast and YouTube. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening and watching, and by doing so, you've helped me to achieve a number of firsts during my first trout season on my local river, such as catching my first fish on the fly and catching my first fish on a fly that I tied. One thing I wanted to do this year but haven't yet is catch a fish on a dry fly. I struggle to know what conditions are right for fishing dries. Does there have to be a hatch? Do I have to spot a rising trout? Or do you speculatively cast into a pool when there is no visible hatch happening to entice a rise? I also sometimes struggle to see my dry fly on the water, so would really appreciate any tips or tricks you could give to achieve dry fly success. Many thanks, Spencer and Tight Lines. P.S. Diet Coke all the way, my man. And if you're ever on this side of the Atlantic, I've got a basket of wings waiting with your name on them. Jordan, wonderful question. Thank you so much. And as a matter of fact, I saw the town. You listed the town that you're from when you sent your question in. Uh, the town that you live in in Wales. I'm not going to reveal that for privacy reasons, of course, but it's an incredibly small world because one of my best friends in the entire world, I've mentioned him on the podcast here before, Ryan McCullough, he actually lives there in that same town you do in Wales. Him and his wife uh, are missionaries for the Assemblies of God over there. And they've been, shoot, how long have they been over there? Ryan's been there for a while. Uh, so really, really small world. If you ever run into Ryan out there, tell him that you know me and, and he'll, he'll treat you right. Ryan's a great guy. Also, does Diet Coke taste the same in the UK as it does in America? Uh, I had one friend from England tell me once that the Mountain Dew in England is different than what they sell here in the States. Uh, anyways, let's, let's chat about dry flies. (laughs) This is not a, uh, a soda a show, although it could be, it, it could be. Um, I actually credit most of my dry fly knowledge to two different folks, my dad and then Ryan McCullough, the fellow I just mentioned. My dad taught me how to fish with dry flies. He gave me like a college level understanding of it. And then Ryan gave me a PhD and I met him in dry flies when I met him, which was shoot almost a decade ago. Yeah. It's been, it's been a while, man. I'm getting old. Anyways, In direct answer to your questions, Jordan, no, there doesn't need to be a hatch for you to fish dries effectively. You don't need to spot rising trout before tossing your dry fly, and speculatively throwing dries is a great way to entice trout to eat. I'll give you a couple of examples. This summer, I was out on one of my local tailwaters, and I was fishing a hopper dropper rig. And this river is really interesting because in the upper portion of it, uh, I've never seen fish rising to a hatch, even when there's a ton of bugs on the water. In the lower portion of it, they'll rise all the time, but in the upper portion, they don't. And it, it's just, I don't understand it. I don't know why it happens that way, but I was still fishing a hopper anyways, and I had a big hopper on with a big uh, crawdad nymph under it. So I was fishing two pretty big flies, and I had a really nice rainbow trout come up out of nowhere and smack the hopper. There wasn't a hatch. He just came up, ate it, and I caught him. It was wonderful. And situations like that happen often enough that, you know, you like to keep that dry fly on there. That's why I love the dry dropper rig so much because you never know when a fish is going to want to eat that dry fly. And another example, too, there was uh, last summer, I had my best day ever on the local creek here in Wyoming. And I was throwing hoppers that day as well. I throw a lot of hoppers in the summer. Love them. Favorite patterns, the chubby Chernobyl. It's just hard to beat that. It's so effective. But anyways, there wasn't, there wasn't like a hopper hatch that doesn't happen, but every single fish ate the hopper that day. Uh, And I caught, I I, I kept track of it the day, but I forgot. I caught a lot. I, I probably caught about 30 fish, which was really, really good. 
I fished all day. It wasn't like 30 fish in an hour or something crazy. I fished all day for it to happen. But there wasn't a hopper hatch, and they were still eating the hoppers. So what we learned from these two stories, both the really good day on my local creek and the random eat on the tailwater, is that trout are opportunistic feeders. If the conditions are right, they will eat a dry fly even if there's not an active hatch. Well, that brings up the logical next uh, question here, right? How do you know what the right conditions are? Well, in the most general sense, it really depends on the time of year because while you don't need an active hatch happening to fish with dry flies, you do need there to have been bugs on the water at some recent point for the fish to really look up and make fishing dry flies more than just another shot in the dark. Uh, another example, I, I live within an hour or two really, really nice tailwaters. And one of the tailwaters has a very early blue wing hatch. It's the earliest blue wing hatch I've ever seen. It starts coming off uh, sometimes in early February. It can start coming off even late January. These blue wings will start hatching. But the fish don't really pay attention to those bugs until they've been on the water for a couple of weeks. It took them a couple of weeks this year. I I remember going out first of February and fishing and there was a hatch on the water and the fish just didn't care. There were a lot of bugs on the water and they were not looking up. And it took about two weeks of bugs on the water for the fish to start being like, oh yeah, hey, there's bugs up there and starting to really rise in earnest. So you do need there to have been bugs hatching at some recent point that will help out. Now, if the conditions are right, tie on a dry fly. I think half the battle that you might be having, Jordan, is overthinking the situation a bit too much. And, I mean, we're prone to do that. We're fly anglers. That's what we do. That's kind of our thing. We overthink it to death, right? Uh, Fish a dry dropper rig, if that's allowed in the UK. I know there are some interesting angling regulations on your side of the pond. Uh, Or just fish a dry fly over a good-looking piece of water. And soon enough, I think you're going to end up catching some fish. Uh, really, that's my best advice to you is just put a dry fly on and go for it. Don't wait for a hatch. Put a dry on, and soon enough, you're going to catch fish. And then pay attention to where you caught that fish on the dry because you'll start to notice patterns. Okay, it ate it, ate it right here in this riffle, or it ate it right here on this seam, or it ate it at the end of this pool. Even though there wasn't an active hatch going on, it was still a good opportunistic moment for the fish to eat. So it went ahead and ate the fly. Now, as to seeing your dry fly better, I almost always use parachute style flies for this exact reason. And if you're fishing really small dry flies, like if the fish are demanding that you fish a size 20 or a 22 or a 24 or a 30 or whatever it is. And yes, they do make size 30 flies. I have and tie a few of those myself then I would suggest using a two dry fly rig where you have your big fly up front, like a size 16 parachute blue wing, and then you tie about 18 to 24 inches of tippet off the bend of that hook, and then you put your really small fly right behind it. That big fly ends up functioning as almost like a strike indicator because you can see it, and if it moves, you know that a fish took your tiny fly. Also, I do want to mention we have an entire masterclass video dedicated to fishing with dry flies. So I do highly recommend that you check that out. It'll answer a lot of these questions with a bunch of great visual aids so you can see it. It won't just be me trying to wave a fly rod here in the podcast studio like I did earlier. Uh, But that masterclass uh, video is linked in the show notes. And Jordan, thank you again uh, for sending that wonderful question on in. Our next question is actually a twofer because we got two uh, nice questions that flowed together really well, and they were a little shorter, so I want to answer them both at the same time. Uh, Well, not at the same time, but in the same little segment here. So first one, uh, Lynette from Wyoming writes in and says, if you are using nymphing, uh, a nymphing rig, where do you put your sinker? Above the first fly or above the second fly? And then Ezra from Illinois writes in and says, hello, love the podcast. I was wondering if I could use regular monofilament fishing line for a leader and tippet. Thanks. Well, I'm going to answer Lynette's question first. Uh, Lynette, I always put my split shot above the first fly in a nymph rig. And I do this because I like to keep a taper in my rigs. And by that, I mean, I, I always put my heaviest fly on top, followed by my smallest flies. I do this because you want to continue that idea 
of a thick to thin taper in all your fly rigs, including dry flies, because that's going to help them cast much more effectively. So keep that idea of a taper going there. And even though your split shot might be small, it still weighs quite a bit more than most flies. So that needs to go above that first fly. That's just where I always put it. Uh, if I'm doing a standard nymph rig. So that would be my, my advice to you there. Now, Ezra, uh, your question, if you can use regular monofilament fishing line for a leader and tippet, absolutely. I got a guide buddy, one of the fishiest fellers I know. He just uses a spool of eight pound fluorocarbon uh, for all of his droppers. He doesn't have tippet. He just uses that. Uh, you can build out a tapered leader from regular fishing line like you've talked about. Uh, there is no difference between monofilament uh, or, pardon me, nylon, uh, the spin casting line and nylon uh, leaders and tippet. Uh, but you do need to have a tapered leader to properly cast flies. Like I mentioned in the answer to Lynette's question, a taper is invaluable for ensuring that your flies cast correctly. If you just tied a nine foot piece of like eight pound onto the end of your uh, fly line and use that as your leader, the flies aren't going to cast super well. They're not going to turn over very well. You're, you're going to be very displeased with the performance, but you can certainly use pieces of regular nylon to tie droppers or other multi-fly, multi-fly rigs with. Uh, the reason that we have fancy tippet and stuff like that is to ensure that it's the right size for our fly hooks, which are obviously a lot smaller than lures and a lot of bait hooks. So that's why we have the fancier tippet and whatnot. Uh, but again, if you don't want to buy the tippet and you just want to use spools of what you've got laying around, just make sure that the monofilament, or pardon me, not monofilament, the nylon fly line or fishing line, there we go, uh, that you buy is the same diameter as the different tippets that you're looking for, uh, then you'll be fine as long as you can ensure that. But you might need spools of smaller stuff as well, which is where tippet can be really helpful. It's nice to have it all in spools, and it, it's just a lot more convenient at that point. So you are paying for a little bit of the convenience uh, with that, but I do think it is worth it. But thank you to Lynette and Ezra for both of those questions. Thomas writes in next, he's from Colorado, and he says, Hi, love the show, and am learning a bunch. I grew up fishing in Colorado, and am just starting to understand the why, and not just the how of a lot of things, thanks to your show. I have a question about leaders. Do you change your leader depending on what flies you're using and what you're fishing for? I just keep one leader on my rod, probably 3 to 4x, and if I feel the need to go smaller, I just tie on smaller tippet and cut it off if I want to go back up. When I go down, I always step it down gradually, like 3X to 4X to 5X to 6X. But I'm wondering if it makes more sense to have a couple different leaders and swap them out instead of just swapping tippet. Thanks. Well, Thomas, that's a really good question, and thank you a bunch for what you said. I really hope we can accomplish that for all of our viewers and listeners here at VFC. We're, uh, understanding the why is so critical to becoming a, uh, an, a competent angler out there on the water. Now, as to your question, Unless I am fishing with streamers, I almost always just have a 4X leader on my rod. The only time that I will put a 5X or smaller on my rod is if I know I am fishing small flies and I will be in a place where I can use shorter casts. I do this because even if I'm fishing small flies, I do like the weight of a 4X leader to help those small flies turn over effectively during the casting process. What you're describing as far as how you step down your leader size, that's absolutely perfect. So props to you. You are doing it the right way. Uh, because when, like if you try to knot together 3X and 5X leader, that can be a bit of a problem because the diameter of those two sizes is so different that it can really be hard to get a knot to seat well. And a bad knot can lead to a lost fish. None of us want that. So you also get a smoother leader turnover when you gradually step down in leader size like that just just make sure you do it the right way the first time don't try to step down from like super thick butt section to 5x i mean that's like trying to serve me up boneless wings and tell me that they're wings they're not it's bone in or not not at all okay uh you certainly could just swap out leaders if you want i really don't see any downsides to it 
Uh, I don't personally because I found that with a 4X leader, I can do about 99% of the fishing that I do. I, uh, I, I mentioned that I don't do that when I'm fishing streamers, and that's because I will just fish a straight piece of 10 to 12 pound fluorocarbon when I'm fishing streamers. Uh, and that's really the only time I don't have a tapered leader on my rods. But if your fishing situation is such that you want to slop, swap leader stream side, go for it. In my mind, it does make more sense, though, just to have one leader and not to deal with tangled leaders because you're, you're going to be pulling them out of the packages and you got to hope they're not tangled. And that could just add to some time. It might just be easier to tie tip it on or cut it off. I personally think that might be easier, but if it's not for you, then what you're doing is fine. And that's just my two cents anyways. But thank you so much for sending that question on in. Michael from Oregon has our next question. He writes in and says, hi there. First off, I want to thank you guys for putting on such an inclusive podcast for beginners of this sport, such as myself. It has been very useful and thoroughly enjoyable. On another note, an ice cold beverage note, Orange Fanta is superior. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, wow. Those are fight words right off the bat here, Michael. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. Back to his question. Uh, my question for y'all, uh, he has two. He says, my question for y'all. One, I am a student at the University of Oregon, and I am planning a five-day road trip centered around fly fishing for this coming spring break. Uh, originally I was thinking of going to Idaho and Montana, but after some light research, I'm now thinking of just going to Montana as there seems to be plenty of water to cover there. With that being said, where do I even begin? How would you spend a five day road trip in Montana? What rivers must I go to during this time? What about fly shops? Any tips, destinations, or just general things to consider are much appreciated. I will be accompanied by a couple of my best friends. And for my second question, I want to talk about careers in fly fishing slash conservancy. I am a senior at University of Oregon now, and I plan to apply to medical school after my time here. That is until recently. I have a true passion for conservation and the outdoors as I do medicine, but recently I decided to take a year and maybe longer after graduation to explore that passion. So my question for you is, how or where do I explore careers in this field? One could rephrase this question to say, is VFC hiring college graduates? I had to shoot my shot. Thank you guys again, Michael from Oregon. Michael, wonderful question. I really, I really appreciate you sending that in. Unfortunately, uh, VFC isn't hiring people from Oregon after what they, USC, UCLA, and Washington did to the Pac-12 because Alex and his whole family are Utah fans. So... This got awkward. No, I'm I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> Short answer for you. If if I had to do it all over again, I would have gone into fisheries biology, specifically working on the habitat side of things. I find that incredibly fascinating now. As it happens, though, I did end up as an English and creative writing major, then an English education major, and then I became a high school teacher. And now that's actually coming to an end because I'm going full-time with VFC here in June. So you guys are going to be getting even more content from me starting in June. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but this, this ain't about me. Uh, I think based on your current interest, you should look into fisheries biology. I, I think that would be an interesting path for you to go down uh, best way to do it, connect with the local fisheries biologist there in Eugene to see if it's something you'd be interested in and get a feel for the type of work they do. Uh, that's where I'd start to see if the biology or conservation side of this business is the right fit for you. And especially being there in Eugene, you've got the option to do some marine stuff, uh, some anadromous stuff with the steelhead and salmon, and then uh, freshwater with all the trout too. So you've got a lot of different options there you could really explore. Now, as to your road trip question, I honestly, and this might shock some folks, I haven't spent that much time in Montana. I grew up in Utah and I live in Wyoming, and my Montana fishing experience is limited to a few streams around Missoula, and then the Madison and parts of the Missouri, and then the Big Hole and the Beaverhead. That's really about it. With that said, I, I fished the Yellowstone as well. I, I forgot that I fished the Yellowstone. <laughs> Anyways, with that said, 
what I would do is I would do a big loop and I'd actually come into Montana from the south and I'd go to Bozeman where you do have access to the Yellowstone River, the Paradise Valley Spring Creeks, and the Gallatin River through Gallatin Canyon, and even the lower Madison below Ennis. Bozeman's a great spot to set up shop. That's why real estate is absolutely through the roof out there. It's out of control. Uh, any, <laughs> anyways, then you can head north and you can fish some of the famous rivers if they're in good shape, like the Blackfoot near Missoula. Uh, once you're up in Missoula, that puts you up near the Idaho panhandle, which you can fish during spring. There's stuff in the panhandle that you can fish during the spring. And I've even heard that there can be some good fishing in Eastern Washington as well as you're heading back home to Oregon. So that might, that, that would be where I would focus. Uh, that Bozeman area is really going to be a good spot, uh, for spring, spring break fly fishing, uh, cause you're, you're going to avoid a lot of the potential high water, really bad weather. You might get in other places as well. So uh, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate you taking the time to send that question on in. And with that, folks, that does it for us on this week's episode of Untangled. Remember, if you have a question about fly fishing that you would like answered, please, please, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you become a better angler, All right? Send the questions on in. There's always a link in the podcast description. And if you could be so kind, rate and subscribe to the show, right? When you do that, it makes the podcast more visible on whatever platform you're listening to, spreads the word to more people, and allows us to keep doing this at a bigger scale for more and more folks to help more and more anglers become better out there on the water. And speaking of the water, get out there, quit listening to me, right? Get out there on the water. And until next week, tie lines. 